welcome. Um, my name is Jonas Helset, uh, head of Bologna Europa, and I'd like to welcome you to this event on industrial decarbonization. I'm going to move away so you can see the screen. Um, we got some hard competition here today, uh, both in terms of other events, but also in terms of uh, the sounds. I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, uh, why are we doing this event here uh, on the industrial decarbonization? Uh, we in Bologna have been working on this for a couple of decades as one of our core topics. And there are some really good reasons for that, we believe. Um, mainly that industry, uh, which makes up about 25, even 30 percent of many countries' emissions around the world, um, actually has been very much outside of the scope of industrial decarbonization policies for those two decades. And obviously, as I'm head of Bologna Europa, my main remit is working on the European Union, but this uh, you know, challenge of decarbonizing industries is obviously something that goes far beyond that remit and where we need to make sure that action is global and is part of the conversations that we have here also at the, the, the COP and the international um, conversations about climate action. Um, why is it so important with industry? Very often when we talk about industrial decarbonization, uh, we hear the, the term just transition. And just transition is um, maybe unfortunately, at least in Europe where I'm following most of those discussions, is connected with um, the coal industry, with the power sector, and therefore often means something that has to close down, something has to be phased out, and therefore something that we have to provide alternative jobs for the workers in that sector, etc. That is an important aspect, but when we talk about industries like steel, cement, chemicals, lime, um, and other heavy industries that are the focus of this event, we are not talking about sectors that we're going to close down or phase out. We're talking about sectors that actually make up the key building blocks of the transition we need. That doesn't mean that every industrial plant that we have today or every industrial uh, production site that we have today, not even every industry we have today, is going to be there in 2050. But it means that quite a lot of them will be there. And these are industries that we therefore need to work with. We need to identify companies that actually see that as a priority and work with them to make that transition come true. And that transition doesn't mean closing down, it means making industry part of the solution uh, instead of you know, part of the problem. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Peter Levi from uh, the IEA, who's been uh, also the author of uh, the IEA's Steel Decarbonization Report. Peter, please, what is yours? Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for the, the invitation once again. Um, I feel like I've been living at the Bologna Pavilion this week. It's, uh, they're very generous hosts and uh, lovely to be back. Um, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the um, uh, net zero by 2050 emission, uh, net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. I uh, can't even get the name of my own, our own scenario right. Um, and specifically focus uh, therein on the, on the heavy industry sectors of which steel and cement and chemicals are all components. Um, I'll get straight to it. Am I clicking this correctly? Yeah. I think many of you will be familiar with our work in this area, so I won't spend too much time on this, but the IEA has really been looking at the heavy industry sector for quite a long time. Um, quite a long time before they were receiving so much attention, I, I, I would personally say when I, I used to talk uh, to um, uh, people outside the agency five or six years ago and said I work on uh, the industry sector usually a blank look would be, re be returned and now really everyone wants to talk about steel everyone wants to talk about cement everyone wants to talk about uh, chemicals and the other uh, outputs of industry um, and uh, the the role that materials will play in the f in the future energy system I think is is really having a much brighter spotlight shone on it um, I won't go through each of these publications. I think most of you are aware of several of them. I think to highlight the critical minerals report we, that we, we released last year, this is another area of you know, really industrial output which might, might not be significant in emissions terms today, but is uh, obviously a, an, an important output or series of outputs from the industry sector that's really um, you know, a, has a different set of considerations around concentration and security that we need to consider. The net zero emissions by 2050 scenario this is a, a slide that's actually 
using the last uh, edition's uh, data for, to compose it, but the messages are the same. We've just updated this scenario in the World Energy Outlook uh, 2022 edition that just came out uh, 10 days ago or so. Um, the, the messages, though, are the same in lots of respects for uh, the industry sector. And so I'll be, be using this, this summary slide just to, to get us started. The, the key message here is that different sectors move at different speeds in the transition to get to net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and this is a scenario without offsets from outside the energy sector, I should note. But to get to that net zero point, that net zero destination, we do see sectors moving at different speeds. And these hard to abate sectors, as they are often referred to, or s more precisely sectors that have hard to abate emissions, um, industry com comprises three of those that we would, we would give that label to, chemical, steel, and cement, as I mentioned. Why are they uh, hard to abate, or why are their emissions hard to abate? One of the primary reasons is the availability of technologies in the market. So this is one of the key things that leads to that designation. The availability of the technologies in the market that can really deliver substantially lower emissions relative to the incumbent technologies. The technology maturity of those today is really one of the, the things that makes them not like solar PV or wind or electric vehicles even today. And it, it possibly explains, or to, to a great extent explains why we're not seeing quite as rapid progress in these areas in these other sectors today. And that's, that's one of the key elements um, that leads them to be hard to evade. Of course, steel, cement, and chemicals are not the only sectors that rely on these technologies. There are lots of examples uh, around here. But see quite a few examples that really uh, are specific to heavy industry sectors on this slide. The starting point for our scenarios is, of course, to project uh, activity levels. So in transport, this might be passenger kilometers. In buildings, this might be um, meters squared of, of heated or cooled space. Um, in the industry sector, it's tons of tonnages of materials. And we do this at quite a uh, high level of granularity by end use application, um, by individual material. And we also uh, consider where the material is being produced. Um, what we can see today as a starting point is around four-fifths of the emissions from material production today from the industry sector are really in uh, emerging, uh, developing and emerging market economies. Um, we see around 80% of the emissions of the nine gigatons or so of emissions from the industry sector taking place in those economies today. That's an important consideration when we talk about the transformation that I'm going to come on to in the next slide. Uh, sorry, in the subsequent slides. The other element of this sort of hard to abate designation, one, one uh, further technical feature is really the existing stock of assets that we are starting with, so our, our point of departure for the transition today. This is just the steel sector, but we have you know, similar pictures provided for the cement and chemical industries, all telling us a very similar message. If we just take the mo main emissions intensive components of uh, the steel industry on this slide, which is really uh, associated with iron making or steel produced from iron, and we just take the iron making furnaces, we have blast furnaces and DRI furnaces here, the, a the average age by, by country, and we compare the average age globally to the typical lifetime on a global average basis. In some countries we use furnaces for, for longer, in some countries for shorter, but if relative to a global average figure of 40 years, we see that the existing stock of capital intensive, emissions intensive assets is around uh, 15 years old today, 10 to 15 years old. And so we can say that they're only around a third of the way through their lifetimes. If we project forward an unaltered emissions uh, intensity from these uh, assets, if we do nothing to these assets, we can see that with, even without the additional capacity that would be required to meet increasing demand in the future, as particularly in emerging market and developing economies, we see uh, increased steel output, increased chemical production, increased uh, cement production to build up infrastructure, to build up housing, to build up vehicle stocks, even without the additional capacity to produce those, if we didn't alter the way that we, uh, we use our existing assets today in these sectors, we would blow the budget for the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. So this really highlights the fact that we need to do something with these existing assets. The good news here is though that several of these assets, steam crackers, blast furnaces, cement kilns, are subject to some degree to, a, a, to a, a, a cycle of investment. So there will be a decision point at some point in this uh, typical lifetime that they are operated where there's, a, there's an intervention point to decide whether to um, renew that existing asset in its current state or replace it with something else. 
um, strategic consideration of those investment cycles could, we believe, if the innovative technologies are ready to be deployed at commercial scale, could lead to a saving of around 40% of those emissions intensive, uh, so of these uh, heavy industry emissions that would otherwise be uh, emitted from these assets operated in the way that they currently are. Existing assets, though, are only part of the part, one part of the picture here. We've also got all the new production capacity that would need to be built, both to replace the existing assets as they're decommissioned, but also to service new demand uh, that it, it, it emerges in the future. Um, so what are the mitigation levers to really make sure that all of that capacity that's installed, um, both existing and, and new, um, how are the emissions reductions achieved given, the, given that progression? We're looking specifically the heavy industry sectors here. So we're seeing quite a large role for CCUS and electrolytic hydrogen, but the majority of the emissions reductions to 2030 are actually provided by strategies that we have really available today, improving energy efficiency, so incremental improvements in energy efficiency of the existing stock, and very importantly, increased material efficiency. So making sure that secondary material production is exploited to the maximum extent possible, making sure that we make best use of scrap plastic scrap aluminium, scrap steel, um, and also, uh, so this, this is part of electrification and part of material efficiency, but also downstream material efficiency strategies where we extend uh, the lifetime of assets in the building sector, make sure that we in use products intensively, that we recycle them effectively. This ser serves to reduce the eventual amount of material that we need to produce and reduces the burden then on the deployment of technologies on the supply side to really make the, the challenge more manageable in terms of the capacity that needs to be deployed. The capacity that needs to be deployed is really this, these innovative technologies. So we need to achieve 90% plus production from, uh, he of heavy industry outputs, so chemicals, primary chemicals, primary steel production, and uh, cement. We need to achieve around 90% plus of uh, the production of those via these near zero emissions routes or emissions uh, routes that could, uh, technologies that can provide the same material, same specification, but with you know, dramatically lower emissions intensities. Because of this uh, technology readiness uh, uh, element dimension that I, I explored at the beginning, the, the extent to which these technologies are available on the market today, we'll see modest progress in this scenario, in this highly ambitious climate scenario, we'll see modest progress to 2030. You can see that in each of these areas, um, the, there's relatively modest progress on the, on the 2030 bar, but then a, a, a wholesale transformation to 2050 in just 20 years, turning over or replacing at the end of their lifetimes the, the existing capacity of that, we, that we have uh, today with these near zero emissions routes. Three main categories here. Hydrogen, hydrogen technologies, so this can be in, in steel, this might be H2 DRI or blending of hydrogen into existing assets in the interim phase. Um, in chemicals, this would be replacing the source of fossil fuel feedstock, nearly all of the feedstock in the chemical sector for hydrogen, for ammonia, for high value chemicals comes from oil and gas today and also coal uh, for ammonia and methanol. Replacing that with, uh, with uh, electrolytic hydrogen is a, is a, a key uh, measure there. Hydrogen less relevant in the cement sector, but can be used to re replace some of the, the thermal energy needs that are currently provided by coal and waste and so on. And then CCUS also seeing critical applications in steel uh, chemicals, particularly for process emissions in the cement industry. Dile direct electrification is another technology family. Typically, these uh, technologies are at earlier stages of development. So here I'm talking about iron ore electrolysis, um, methods to electrify steam crackers, so ways that we can actually, you know, in some ways, not that the aim is to avoid hydrogen in CCUS, but um, have, a, have a route to substantially fewer emissions without uh, using CCUS or hydrogen. But as I say, these tend to be at even earlier um, stages of development today. Everything I've mentioned so far has been about technology. The other side of that coin is policy, of course. The other side of the decarbonization coin for industry is, is policy. I'm not going to go through this whole slide because I'm already taking a bit too long. I think I'm looking at Lena's face and seeing a, seeing a clock. <laughs> um, but we, we, there are a few things in our thinking about this topic that we, we lay out in this slide. The first is that the actors in the system, whether producers, whether researchers, whether governments, um, whether financial institutions, 
these, these actors will all need to collaborate to some degree. This will make the, the transition uh, possible and it will make it much more efficient if they, they collaborate more effectively. Fundamental frameworks for um, l laying out a kind of roadmap, a clear signal to industry as to what the prevailing environment for policy is gonna be in terms of CO2 pricing, in terms of um, mandates for improving energy intensity. Clear signals need to be sent to industry. As I said at the beginning, these assets that industry is having to invest in are very capital intensive. You cannot be changing, you know, month to month the, the policy environment. That's, a bit, that's an important thing. And, and as a component of that, particularly for these targeted actions, mobilizing finance and creating the conditions where finance can be mobilized to support uh, early stage demonstration projects, uh, support the first even few commercial scale plants through to financial viability. These are areas where we see Again, government having a, a very uh, a important role um, in the early stages. Of course, you know the private sector needs to take uh, take over the, the the majority of the financing long term. That's the destination we need to get to, um, and part of the transition there can really be creating on the on the pull side, so on the demand side, uh, differentiated markets for the products for these industries for products that are produced with substantially fewer emissions. This is one method of doing that, and on the push side. Again, making sure that finance is directed um, where it needs to be, uh, where it needs to support the kind of uh, the riskiest elements of the innovation that needs to take place. And then there are the necessary enabling conditions, um, infrastructure. Can't emphasize this enough. All of the all of the technologies that I've required, I've talked about, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's CCUS, uh, whether it's direct electrification, even for these large energy intensive industries. You need to have the right uh, um, infrastructure in place, you know, often in advance of feeling the confidence of really investing um, in lots of capacity in that region. So CO2 transport and storage networks, uh, hydrogen pipelines, electrolyzers, that kind of thing. Um, infrastructure, tracking progress, and making sure that everyone's on the same page with respect to data and with respect to the performance of uh, these assets on an emissions intensity basis, um, making sure that that's available, making sure that that's shared is a, an important enabling condition. And then, of course, this very important aspect of ensuring a level playing field between regions, making sure as much as possible, again, through collaboration, that policy environments instituted in different aspects of the market for these products, which are international um, and highly competitive, I might add, in, in most instances, making sure that there's a, there's a level playing field for really um, it, providing the security to people who are going to invest in different markets, making sure that there's going to be a kind of fair level of competition across different regions is, is a very important component there. And there's lots of ways to do that, but I won't go into that now in too much detail. Uh, I think I'm going to hand back to the, to the moderator and to the, to the next speakers. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, I obviously, obviously, we're going to um, we're going to be uh, sharing the uh, presentation also uh, uh, on our website after the event. Uh, the idea is, of course, that this is being recorded and that people can come back to to look up the speech and and um, and contact also Peter, of course, uh, to read the report later. So, thank you. Um, the next speaker out uh, is Montserrat Mir from uh, the, uh, well, I, I know from many years of collaboration in the uh, European Trade Union Con Congress, who is now a uh, special advisor at the ITUC, International uh, Trade Union Con Congress, on um, the Just Transition uh, Center, which I mentioned earlier. This is, of course, a key element. We heard a lot from Peter now about modeling, about you know policies that need to be put in place to, to make these things happen. But I think uh, uh, Montserrat also can, can tell us a bit about you know, what impact that has on, on the, the sites where this is actually how to be implemented on, and the people are working there. So please, sponsor up. That. Well, good morning and thank you. Uh, we have listened to the experts and it's uh, really important, but I'm here to represent the workers' voice. As Jonas has said, I was the previous uh, political responsible at you level on energy, climate, gender, and social protection. And that provides me um, a good knowledge of how to mix all these elements in a just transition. Because probably all of you know, but if not, I will explain that just transition is a trade union. The origin is a trade union definition that we fight a lot to include in the Paris Agreement. 
After that, we were a little orphan, and came the um, ILO with the guidelines, with the Just Transition Guidelines, that was our main book to explain our members how to include climate action in the trade union and labor agenda. That is important because in, especially in this COP, we are listening a lot on finances, on how to finance that for trade unions is relevant. We are really involved in this, but we must, we must, not, we must take into account that the sectors, the industry sectors, at the same time that they are the more polluters, are the ones we, where we, the trade unions, we have a more structured labor force and we have a lot of trade union power. That means we have a certain responsibility, a certain commitment to do a, a good bridge, a good transition, because as Jonas said, the idea is to go from jobs from the industry sector based on oil, gas, and polluter sectors to new sectors that through the technology and through investments, they came us to uh, renewables and to create good jobs in those sectors. And this is where we are in this process. But our, our members, they are really, there is, I don't think no one member in our sectors that they don't see that climate change is a reality and we need to be involved in this transformation, but not after. We must be involved before and during. Now we are at the middle of the process, and we need to know how this industrial strategy that not only at the European level, here at the COP, is necessary, because it needs to be accompanied by an action plan on jobs. We cannot be at the situation like in Colombia, I see my colleague from Colombia, that the workers, they, they know that the mine is closed by the newspapers or by the TV, and they notice that they have lost this job without any scheme on social protection, any support, and any idea of land recuperation or job creation in the region. Because that is an important element, the regional aspects. We are working very hard with different countries because uh, very often those industries are focused or are installed in a specific regions. And the idea is to have a plan to provide good jobs, decent jobs, well paid, because there is another risk, no? Our members in the, uh, in the industrial sectors, they say, we have a good job with a good salary, what happens next? We cannot go to the renewables with a diminish of our rights, our uh, salaries and our uh, ways to live and that is where we are we are trying to convince because the just transition center is important to say was created in 2016 by the international trade union uh, mm, confederation to support unions but also to work with cities we are we are engaged with c40 the big organization on cities we are working also with the big companies on the energy sector, means the ones that are at the same time job creators. We need to be in contact with them. We need to discuss with them. And at this time where we are here, we are presenting a study that the International Trade Union Confederation is producing because it's not already finalized. In this study, we have merged industrial we have also uh, the International Trade Union Confederation, and we have gathered uh, a lot of experts, but also trade unions, because we have our own experts to see how to transform in good jobs in the different sectors. I want to say that in renewables, in the CCS, in uh, construction, in transport, in a lot of sectors, in this study you can see the proposals from the trade union movement to anticipate through reskilling, through capacitation of the workers to play a good role in this transformation. In this COP also, we are asking for transparency because as I have said, there are a lot of discussions on how to finance the just transition process. But the first example that came last year during Glasgow, that was for example, the partnership with South Africa, it was welcomed, very well welcomed, by our members in COSATU, for example, I put an example. What happens when the discussion starts to implement the 8 billion in South Africa to do this coal phase out and decarbonization process, the door was closed for the trade unions. And that is not a good example, a good pilot to show to other parts of the world. That means, yes, with these partnership agreements, but with transparency.
transparency with unions and communities at the table and with an open discussion to have a good transition to create jobs. I don't know if I am uh, late or not, but uh, the question of the technology, because I think that for Bellona is important. We have had different, different meetings where Bellona have participated, your colleague from Oslo, and it's important the technology, but the technology cannot be um, you know, bad for the workers' interest because there is good studies, there are good studies that for each five, ten jobs that we will lose in the classic industry, classic polluter industry, we can create more, I don't have now the data exactly, but we can create the double in the uh, new uh, industries, in the green industries, in the renewable industries. And that is where we are. Also, I think that is very important, as I say, the, the regional aspect and also the transformation, because this, this is a question of people. Just transition is a lot of technology through a lot of financial support, but it's about people. And the, as industrial usually say, you cannot decide about us without us. And also in this COP, a lot of closed doors to the interest and to the presence and to the voice of the workers. And I not mention the Egyptian, I, me I mentioned the workers from around the world that very often they see that they cannot be at the table. Workers at the table to do a just transition process because the just transition process includes transparency, includes, of course, a reduction of emissions that we are committed, but includes a social protection. Uh, ITUC is uh, now working with ILO on a global social protection fund because we are looking that in a lot of countries social protection is missing and without a good social protection scheme it's very difficult to do this bridge transformation for workers to go to the new jobs and at the same time i want to share that I, I, I repeat we are in the middle of the process we are late there are a lot of jobs that are disappearing and i will put the example of spain last mine was closed is my country last mine was closed in 2018 but due to the political crisis due to the pandemic the funds that were allowed to, uh, to do this transformation, to do the decarbonization, to create new jobs, were delayed. It was a social, uh, social pressure. It was a social, um, I don't know. They were very upset, the workers, because the mine was closed. They don't have job, and they, uh, uh, they support, uh, social support was real, ready to end, and now, that is coming, that is arriving, but it was a year in the middle that a lot of people don't have a job in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of the pandemic. And that we must, uh, we must try to not repeat this mistake. At the same time, we have affiliates in India that they are committed with the just transition and they want, uh, especially at the coal phase out process, they want to include the just transition. They are a mining workers, uh, uh, union that have included the just transition in their negotiation because they are the, m the main interested but very often they see that when there is transformation the quality of the jobs is less and the number of jobs is less that means that they, they, they are engaged in the discussion when they can especially at sectorial level but not at the confederal level to see how they can the solution and not be the subject of the problem that that creates for the jobs. I think that my time uh, has finished, uh, but I want to say that mm, all of you, you must be aware that without workers and communities participation is not possible. Uh, yesterday I was, no, before yesterday at the lounge of uh, the Marrakesh Partners and Antonio Gutierrez says zero tolerance to greenwashing and workers at the table must be uh, together in this uh, climate change transformation. Thank you very much. In one week we will have this study. I will deliver to Bellona because I think you have participated in some of the uh, I think it's important because it's sector by sector, industrial uh, uh, domain, that you will have the possibility of job creation, the proposals from the trade unions, and through uh, John. Uh,
you will have access to this study. Thank you so much, uh, Montserrat, and, and uh, thanks for all the work you do. I mean, this is, this is absolutely uh, you know, crucial. Uh, if we have a climate policy that is not a social policy, then, then we're failing. And I think the, po the examples you're making um, you know, about the impact, if you have a climate policy that means you know, uh, loss of thousands of jobs, there is no win in that. And it's also not a climate policy. It's, it's something that might make one country's uh, emission uh, portfolio look better, but the emissions are also likely to go somewhere else and you know we need to actually change the way we, we produce things not stop uh, people from having a job so uh, with that next up is um, a very distinguished uh, panel uh, but I'm going to leave the introduction of the panel to an old friend uh, we've been working with for probably more than a decade on industrial decarbonization um, Theo Mitchell who's uh, um, the uh, head of um, uh, the Children Investment Fund Foundation's work in Europe uh, on climate, but also on industrial decarbonization. Uh, Theo, please. Oh, uh, one thing, uh, just for everyone to know, I was told to, to say that speakers should hold the microphone just below the chin. Uh, we have a lot of background noise here, so it's important that the recording catches the noise, please. Thank you. Uh, would the panelists like to, to come and take a seat at the front? Please. Thank you. So the, the purpose of the panel now, we've heard a bit about the technological pathway, some of the financing challenges, policy challenges, and the role of government and the, the importance of protecting workers' rights and jobs throughout that. We're now going to transition a bit and g hear from the experience and insights of our panelists on the practical challenges of industrial carbonization and, and uh, learn from their insights and experiences uh, of their work relating to that. Um, w we've got four panelists. I'll introduce them in turn, and then if we could have each panelist speak for about five minutes to give some introductory remarks, and then we'll, we'll open up to a Q&A from there. So um, w we'll start uh, at this end with, with Karen, if that's okay. So Dr. Karen Skirin is the head of laboratory of construction materials at Ecole Polytechnique uh, at the University of Lausanne. So Karen. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So, um, my name is Karen Scrivener. I work at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal in Lausanne, basically a university. And my expertise is in the field of cement and concrete, where I am increasingly involved on looking at everything to uh, bring about decarbonization uh, in that sector. So I think the first thing to say about cement is to that you know there are a lot of misunderstandings here. Um, yes, it does make up a very large proportion of world CO2 emissions, about 8%. But this is only because of the very large quantities produced. There's more cement and concrete produced than all other materials put together. And in an intrinsic perspective, it's actually quite a low carbon material. So you're not going to improve things by replacing it with other things. People talk a lot about wood, which is fine. Wood can be low carbon, but the problem there is we just simply don't have enough. Um, you know, it represents about 8% of building materials today. And if we wanted to replace just one quarter of wood with cement and concrete, we'd have to um, um, grow new forests one and a half times the size of India, which clearly is gonna be a tall order. So um, that doesn't mean there's nothing we can't, we can't do. And I think there's a lot that can be done, particularly if we stop believing in miracles. You know, we're, we're talking about this material produced in this colossal quantities. And the material we use today is really a, a consequence, a direct consequence of the chemistry of the earth and its geology. So we can't imagine that there's some miracle low CO2 cement out there. It's just not possible. Um, we have to work at all levels of the value chain. And we have estimated in a report we did for the European Climate Foundation about five years ago, that if we put together all the different levels of the clinker, of the cement, of the concrete, and then the buildings, we could actually implement reductions of the order of even 80% uh, compared to what we have today with existing technologies and without much change in codes and practices. Because, you know, we really waste a lot of concrete. 
um, buildings are optimized. It's much cheaper just to use a bit more cement than to pay an engineer to more optimize your buildings. So we really can be done, do that. I think the second aspect I just want to mention before moving on is the real importance of the Global South. I mean, this was brought out already in the, um, the presentation of Peter, but it's particularly important in the field of cement. The demand for cement in, in Europe, for example, is about 5% of world demand, and it's going to stay about like that for the next few decades. Whereas in Africa, okay, the amount is very lo low today, but it's foreseen there will be a tenfold increase in demand by 2050. And, you know, this is really going to be needed to house the people on that continent where the population is forecast to grow. And I think we have a duty to give a decent level of, of living to people, which involves very much having uh, decent housing conditions. So while in Europe, I think it's very achievable to go to net zero, I think there's a lot of different levers, including at some stage carbon capture and storage, which can bring about net I think the challenge uh, in Africa I I is different, and it's often not really engaged in by the big agencies uh, where they make all They tend to focus very much on the um, kind of developed world and not what's needed in the developing world. So that's uh, just a few introductory work, uh, remarks to set the scene in the field of cement and concrete. Right, this one's the battery might be on. Yeah, I think the battery's going on that one. I'll pass this one along in a minute. Okay, next we'll hand over to um, Lee Beck, who's a senior director at Clean Air Task Force. Lee. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much to our partners at Bologna for hosting us here. Um, it's an honor to be here. For those of you who don't know the Clean Air Task Force, we're a global um, climate organization focusing on overlooked solutions for a zero carbon future. We're also discussing um, the nexus of energy access, climate action, and energy security in a world of poly crisis at our pavilion in the next hall called Zero Carbon Future. And I want to start my remarks with reminding what day is, is today. It's um, Decarbonization Day, the first ever decarbonization theme day at COP, focusing on what has, have been climate blind spots, oil and gas, industrial sector decarbonization, but are responsible for close to 80% of emissions, primary energy demand emissions globally. So I think that's, that's really important to um, point out for this conversation. And I also, I agree with everything that has been said already. I thought that um, what we're learning about the industrial sector is that the decarbonization of the sector is incredibly complex. It requires multiple technologies to play together. It, when we're thinking about Six. cement, it's fuel switching, efficiency, carbon capture and storage. But it also, we talk a lot about cement and steel, but it's also refining petrochemicals. And the demand for fuels is likely going to go up as we're talking about energy access as the first building block for um, effective climate mitigation, but also the first line of defense against um, the impacts of climate change. I think that in the past, just reflecting globally over the past um, couple of years, probably the past three years, as the industrial sector is um, increasingly getting attention from policymakers, we have seen unprecedented industrial policy to tackle some of these challenges, particularly as we're thinking not just about the sector as an isolation, but a building block of our economy, a building block of our workforce. So, for example, in the United States, 500, uh, half a trillion dollars, 500 billion dollars, a lot of these policies um, touch on the industrial sector. There's, there is funding for demonstrations of next-gen technologies, 24-7 clean electricity. Um, there is deployment incentives to commercialize some of these technologies. The same for Europe. In innovation Fund really focus on industrial decarbonization. So this is all really important as we're trying to reduce costs, enable learning by doing, and enable the deployment of next-gen technologies and asset transformation. But I do want to, you know, remembering where we are here in Egypt and Africa, I do want to double down on the global south and really thinking that there's a lot of industrial facilities there and we need to think about how we're going to help decarbonize while we're also 
solving the issues of um, energy access. So I will stop here. I'm really excited for this conversation. Again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, now we're going to hand over to Anne van Eisendijk, who's the Vice President and Head of Government Affairs and Environment at ArcelorMittal. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me here. I think um, we, we heard we are really very much part of the conversation. Um, so as we also heard, it's very important that we keep jobs. It's also very important that we keep steel. Huh? We should not forget that we need the steel industry. Uh, steel, um, we heard cement is responsible for more or less 8%. Steel is the same. 8% of global um, emissions are, uh, are coming from steel. But the beauty of steel is steel is infinitely recyclable. It's a great material and we have heard already from Peter, there are a number of technologies available that make sure that we have a zero carbon footprint. A number of technologies that is really important to remember because the, co the technologies will very much depend on where you are and, and the various circumstances in which you, you, your company is. So steel is vital, basically is vital for the decarbonization because you look around, you have steel everywhere. And we don't have a decarbonized world without renewables, renewable energy. But for renewable energy, we, need renew we also need decarbonized steel. Because we have steel in wind turbines, we have it in solar panels, we have it everywhere. So anyway, important. <laughs> we, ha we have to be part of the conversation and people need to listen. So um, we are a global player. And as a global player, we believe we have a very specific role to play. Um, and we are committed to reach uh, net zero in 2050, and we are, have our plans ready to go. Um, so now we have also heard decarbonizing um, the steel sector is quite complex because you have existing assets. And the assets are huge. You have a number of different uh, furnaces often. You have downstream operations. You have jobs. You have a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration. And um, there are two main routes, we heard this, to decarbonize. So there is basically already now there is the electric route based on scrap, but there is the integrated route, which is basically based on coal-fired coal, coal uh, blast furnaces. And we, one can say, okay, let's just use the, blast, the, the electric furnaces, it's easy, no? you just use the renewable energy, but that is scrap-based, and there's not enough scrap. S there is not going to be enough scrap because demand for steel, as I said, steel is essential, also for the decarbonization, demand of steel is going up rather than down. And so we need also to decarbonize the integrated route. It's absolutely essential. And then for that, we need, so there are a number of routes. We saw this. Um, so there's a hydrogen-based route, there's CCS, etc. cetera. Um, everything is basically based on access to renewable energy. And we need a lot. I mean, like really a phenomenal amount of renewable energy. And of course, it is very costly, so we need a lot of finance. Um, so. And, and then the other thing is, we have to see that there is, it's, it's very complicated because we have different regions. So we are, for example, in Europe, and um, then we have a regulatory framework that obliges a certain amount of things. And they can go into b more into details afterwards. And then you go into another region, for example, India, that has completely different setup and completely different situation. Access to energy is different. Um, the needs are different. So we need to take this into consideration when we put together, first of all, the roadmap, but also when we look at this decarbonization, the, 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 the speed and the possibilities to achieve it. And then very oft very important, I, we, you just heard, steel is globally traded. So we need a level playing field. And what you don't want is deindustrializing wine region, then shipping everything over the whole entire world um, from maybe a world that is less regulated so carbon leakage, job leakage. So you really have to take into consideration every single region with its specific situation. And I leave it at this for the moment. Thank you, Anne. And then last but not least, we're gonna go to Felipe Sanchez, who uh, joins us as a research associate from the Climate, Energy and Society Unit of Stockholm Environment Institute. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I've just to say, for those of you who haven't heard of the Leadership Group for Industry Transition, it's a public-private um, partnership that was launched uh, in 2019 by the governments of Sweden and India. Um, it is supported by the World Economic Forum and the Secretariat sits at SEI, which is where I'm based. And our work is centered around three pillars. So one of them is uh, helping countries put together roadmaps and national implementation plans. The second one is providing the evidence that the transition is taking place. And the third one is 
um, supporting the flow of finance to emerging economies so that decarbonization can happen. And uh, Peter did a really great job of setting the scene, but one other thing I'd add is that um, we expect that there's going to be a shift in production of steel globally. So uh, in the future, we're expecting increases in countries such as India, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Indonesia, but this is not where the low carbon decarbonization projects are. We're not seeing the projects in those places. And given Leader's focus on finance, we looked at the, the role of, of international finance institutions, or IFIs. We looked at these institutions because they already do a lot of work on development, on uh, clean energy, on financing climate mitigation, but not so much on, on industry. So we had a report that we published uh, just earlier this week, uh, which was based on us firstly looking through project databases, uh, the strategies of international finance institutions, uh, and interviewing them. And so what did we learn? We learned that uh, since 2000, there's about 80 projects that have been financed by international institutions uh, with a total of three and a half, almost three and a half uh, billion dollars. 70% uh, of those projects were just focusing on incremental improvements to, to existing plants. So nothing radical, just uh, yeah, process improvements. And most are concentrated in Asia, uh, Central Asia and Europe. And one thing that we found was that there isn't really a good fit between international finance institutions and steel companies. Steel companies require large sums of money for projects. They can source the funds from financing from corporate banks and capital markets. And, it, okay, and uh, the due diligence required by international finance institutions mean that there's stringent sustainability checks. On the IFI side of things, uh, the large sums mean would leave them very exposed to certain countries or companies. Uh, there's some issues on corporate ownership of, of these companies. And also the technologies, as Peter showed as well, that are in some cases a bit too early and unproven and therefore present a risk. So how can we, what, so what can we do about that? Um, I guess we, the report has five uh, recommendations. I won't run through all five, but I will just say that throughout them all is this theme of or underlying thread of international cooperation. We need IFIs to focus on, on helping, um, helping countries with their ena enabling technologies for steel decarbonization. So for instance, on green hydrogen, and this could be by supporting countries with roadmaps, um, or even in the case of the de developed countries, uh, funding some of those international institutions that are supporting uh, industry transition, such as uh, we heard today the UK and Sweden uh, funding the uh, climate investment funds, the announcement made earlier today. The other role that which is linked to this is uh, IFI is acting as a sort of knowledge partners to strengthen policy frameworks. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, right, so we start now. Swap mics again. Um, could we start by opening up to the audience? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question of any of our panelists? If not, then, then I'll, I'll take the prerogative. And, and uh, Felipe, could we come to you first, please? So obviously, um, public finance reform is one of the big, you know, big agenda items at this COP, uh, sitting outside the negotiation space. And we've heard from political leaders like Mia Motley around the, the debt and uh, financial challenges facing many developing countries and uh, the differential in, in rates, interest rates that different countries can borrow at. Um, I wondered if you could talk to us a bit about, uh, just talk to us a bit more about what this means. If, if IFIs aren't well suited to, f to financing and supporting investment in the steel sector, where do you see that public finance support coming from? Um, thank you. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can start by saying that one of the issues which you've kind of picked up on is that um, countries at the moment have a limited focus on uh, decarbonizing heavy, uh, developing countries, I should say, or emerging economies, currently have a limited focus on the decarbonization of heavy industry. And this is because, quite rightly, the focus on uh, financing has been around uh, clean energy and adaptation. And... Um, and this has obviously proven very difficult for finance institutions to come in, particularly those that are driven by um, country, the country demands for decarbonization. And that's why one of the reasons we focused on this uh, idea of, um, of IFI supporting this strengthening of a policy framework was a, was a key thing that came out of our report. Thank you. Looking around the audience again, uh, Jonah.
Thanks. Um, so I, I heard about like from the beginning, although um, you know Ms. Rocca just left, but uh, this was also related to the just transition point that we, we are speaking about how to be more transparent and fair about this. Um, but it's very important to also see how do we make the funds available and the finance to mobilize some of these uh, just transition work that we are looking at because when we especially look at the industries in India, um, you know, because I come from India, so I'm just taking the example from India because a lot of the workers in the coal mines are in the different region, which is like the eastern side, largely in India, while most of the RE works and RE job and the transition is happening in the western and the southern part of India. So that involve a lot of migration as well. And in India, it's a very specific challenge of the regional local languages and the language barrier, the cultural barriers. So there are like multifold challenges with the industrial decarbonization as happened the just transition will be like impacted with this as well. So how do we mobilize some of these funds which is available? That's the first question. And the second question for the panelists would be, um, and especially for the cement sector, when we look at India, Indian cement industries are already at their best specific energy consumption at the world level. So from here, what do you think? How do they go next? for the decarbonization because it's enough that they have done on the specific energy consumption, enough they have done on the efficiency improvement, while the other industries can probably learn from this, but um, the important task is to just see like how do we now move towards the better raw material side? So how do we mobilize some funds for that as well? And how do we look at the decarbonization of the cement going much more deeper? And I heard somewhere, like some of the panel that we have been organizing that at least for the cement, it's possible to abate rather than saying it's hard to abate. So how do we make it possible for the cement particularly? So yeah, those two questions, thanks. Brilliant, thank you. And just before we hand the mic over, would you mind just saying your name and affiliation as well, just for the panelists? Yeah, uh, I am Kajol. I work with WRI India. I lead the industrial decarbonization work there, thanks. Brilliant, thanks very much. Does anyone want to take the question? Should we go to Karen first? And, and Karen is part of that. So. I, I just reflect that in the opening remarks from all the panelists, we talked quite a lot about the context, right, and the, the, the different regional contexts for industrial decarb decarbonization. I think this question is starting to pivot to more to what's the, the, the sp specific solutions for those different regional contexts. So if you can think about that as well. Yes, so fortunately, um, I know the cement sector in India quite well because that's where we're working for our main project. So. Um, I think y you're right. The production of clinker in India is one of the most efficient. But there's a lot more to be done by substituting clinker by other materials. So for the last uh, eight, nine years, we've been working with partners in India to develop the use of what's called calcine clay. So you maybe know that fly ash is a lot used in, as a substitute in cement. We hope, of course, fly ash is going to disappear if we move away from coal. And even today, the amount of fly ash, even though it's enormous, is not really sufficient to go to the levels of substitution that are possible from a technical point of view. So we've developed this new cement type we call LC3. We will have a presentation in the India Pavilion just after on that if you want to know more. And uh, with this, it's possible to go to much higher levels of substitution which reduce uh, CO2 emissions substantially further. We can look at further reductions of the order of 20 to 30 percent. But then reduction must come from the downstream side. So when we formulate concrete, this is often done very inefficiently. Um, you, you know, of course, in India, there's still a lot of mixing of concrete by the side of the road. We have to go to a more industrialized production of, of concrete, which can use much less cement, even half as much cement is possible. So it's really, again, there substantial reductions. And then uh, we have to work on the design stage. And, you know, many people think the design is to do with um, changing codes, which is a very long process. Of course, changing codes is always important. But even within the existing codes, there's a big margin by 
uh, we can use uh, digital tools to optimize, you know, help to the, the structural engineers to better optimize their designs. And this is also coming into play. So I think these are the three big levers, substitution of clinker, reducing cement in, in, in concrete, uh, reducing concrete in buildings, and then the rest will have to come from something like, you know, mineralization, reforestation, carbon capture and storage. But we can, the point is all these first three can be done today, they can be done fast and they can be done very large scale. So it's not perfect, but it can take us a long way in the right direction. Yeah, very happy to come in here. Thank you so much for this question and engaging in this conversation. I will say I want to um, start where you left off, and this is the commercialization of carbon capture technologies. In fact, advanced economies, cement stations, as you said, or factories are much more polluting than em emerging markets. So there's an opportunity for advanced economies to really help commercialize these technologies. Um, we're seeing uh, pilot pr or large-scale demo projects, the first of a kind in Norway, of course, also in the U.S., multiple plants. So that's really important. There's policy available to deploy these technologies. Um, I think, you know, this again plays to the complexity, multitude of solutions needed. But I want to also reflect a little bit about where we are again, Africa. I think there has been this conversation about, okay, how we're going to finance this. So for example, in Africa, the problem isn't necessarily the inavailability of capital, it's the lack of deal flow, right? Because I think uh, G20 Infrastructure Hub is about to release a report that will clearly show that the default rates are low. There's just not enough deal flow for projects in general, including energy projects. The other piece is the World Bank CCUS Trust Fund is um, set to run out next week in 2023. So getting this replenished so we can enable indigenous innovation in next mover markets is really important. And as my colleague Lily Ordano likes to say, we're often looking at Africa as a consumer of technology rather an innovator itself. So today we're actually gonna host um, the launch of the Africa Center of Carbon Ex Excellency for Carbon Management at 4.30 in the Zero Carbon Future Pavilion, which will be an effort for indigenous innovation to kind of build the workforce for the next generation technologies and also really support a partnership approach rather than a very outdated paradigm of technology transfer. So I think it's, it's really important for us to now get into um, this idea of planning, it was also on, this, on the IEA slides we saw earlier, how can we shorten the deploy deployment timelines of these technologies in next mover markets, and that's through understanding sources and sinks, but also mapping infrastructure and then really investing in kind of laying the groundwork. This is also includes CO2 storage characterization, workforce. So I think there's, it's really important for us to think about it holistically. So thank you again for this question, and I hope... Um, this was a helpful answer. Thank you. Um, that, that's a nice segue, I think, from the, from the public to the private and other sources of finance. And Anna, I wonder if we could just come to you now. So um, you, as I said, we've heard a bit about some of the challenges from Felipe about mobilizing international public finance. Perhaps you could give us a bit of a sense of the, some of the challenges that a company that is developing and investing in decarbonization projects globally is facing and what support you might need specifically from governments to help overcome those investment hurdles. Thank you very much. It's a very relevant question, of course. Um, so um, we have heard just before that there are different um, solutions for the decarbonization no, in the steel sector. But I, I think the first thing that we need and phenomenon I already said is energy. We really, really need renewable energy in absolute unbelievable quantities because, um, as, we, as we heard, there are a number of technologies available. Um, one is hydrogen-based um, direct reduced iron plants that will basically replace coal-based blast furnaces. That is the idea. But for that, we need hydrogen. We need renewable hydrogen. And so we need a lot of renewable energy to produce enough hydrogen to be able to do this. So energy is absolutely crucial. And the issue that we are facing for the moment now is, for example, in Europe. Um, so one of the ways to go away from the coal is to use, first of all, build a DRI plant and use gas. There's no gas. Not enough gas anymore. 
And then, the, of course, ultimately, we would like to want to use uh, renewable hydrogen. There is no hydrogen yet. But decisions need to be taken now, because now we absolutely need to go ahead and start investing. So, you know, what is the energy doing, uh, the, the industry doing? Um, in other c countries, we, can, we have started now, we have broken the ground on a big investment on a DRI plant in Canada. Um, in, yeah, so in Europe, we have a number of them in the pipeline. We hope that we can go ahead. Um, we have a number of CCS projects and CCU projects that we are starting at industrial scale. Again, we need a lot of energy to be able to do this. So that is the first thing. Then the second thing is finance, of course. It's everything is extremely expensive. It's billions. We are talking really billions. And so who is going to pay for it? Is it the customer? Um, so, you know, we need to, we need, so we need basically support. Um, and then you have the other problem is the regulatory framework. It's very different from region to region. And also within the region, there are issues. For example, in Europe, there are lengthy debates about what the ETS system is going to look like, what is, uh, what is the definition of green hydrogen or sustainable hydrogen, how is the CCS system going to work, how are you going to kind of transfer carbon from one country to the other. All these things are not very clear. If you go outside of the region even, that is even worse. So um, in the US, so who knows what, I mean, the, the definitions are also not clear. So internationally, things are not clear, and even within the, Within Europe, we don't have a stable framework yet. We really need to get this done. Um, then we need to, of course, the one of the biggest problems that we are facing is the difference in approaches. So we have Europe based on the ETS system, so carbon, uh, carbon price. We have other regions that believe into something completely different, which is, for example, spending a lot of money into supply side um, subsidies. So how do, you, how do you make this happen? I mean, the steel is a globally traded um, com commodity in the end, a very globally traded um, good. If you go, so we cannot, we have to make sure that every region can invest and can go through the decarbonization. And if one region attracts all the investments, that's not going to happen. Um, so that, that's a big problem. And then of course we need absolutely the demand for the decarbonized products because um, for the moment, uh, you, know, you do the investment, and afterwards you still have operating costs probably higher because of, because of the renewable energies, etc., that will be higher to even operate the asset. And so, you know, you need to be able to, to be sure that people will buy your products. And so you need a kind of lead market. So we need governments to create lead markets. So these are just some of the challenges and <laughs> things that we need. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jonas, can we go to you? Any other hands while I'm here? No. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question uh, to Anne, and I think you, you started answering it already. Um, but it's, you know, I, I've been spending the last decade working with uh, industry stakeholders and people in the IEA and others who are doing the modeling. And you know, one of the key <laughs> messages that comes out of that work is that there is no silver bullet for the carbonizing industry. We need a portfolio of technologies. Now, I think you're following the European debate as well a bit, and, and what I observe in Europe, and in particular in the steel industry, but I think it's, it's a Europe-wide, uh, well, the economy-wide uh, phenomenon in Europe uh, is something that looks very much like a hydrogen hype, where every sector is, is subscribing to hydrogen as a solution, but where there's very little talk about what you mentioned, which is the energy requirement to produce that hydrogen. Certainly, we're talking about green hydrogen from renewable electricity. It's an energy intensive process. And I see one after the other of the steel companies in Europe announcing you know, hydrogen as their main or sometimes only solution to, to decarbonize the industry. That makes me somewhat concerned that we are throwing too many eggs in one basket. So I'd really be keen to hear your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. That's a very good question, and um, I mean, everybody grapples with this problem for the moment, no? because um, DRI EF seems to be the silver bullet for everybody for the moment, but of course there is not going to be enough energy, no? so, I mean, for the moment at least. No? Um, on the other side, I can, I mean, from the European Commission, for example, I can tell you that they are pushing very much the hydrogen agenda, um, and so th they want to create demand to be able to have, of course, the pipeline of projects, so it's always a chicken and egg situation. No? But um, I'm, I'm compl I, I agree completely. We need to have different technologies. There's also electrolyzers, oh, that's a, you know, but this is not yet sufficiently mature. Um, we are also working on that. But we need to have a panoply of technologies. And um, 
they need to be all tested at scale and implemented and the regulatory framework needs to be there because there is not going to be one solution and also basically you need a combination because you cannot actually achieve a full zero carbon uh, steel plant only based on hydrogen EIF. You need to also get risk of the, the tailpipe emissions at the end. So there need to be also CCS or CCU or some, you know, there needs to be some other solution and there will maybe in 10 years we will have other solutions I mean, hopefully we are working on and we are trying to also look into new emerging technologies all the time. For the moment, this is basically what we have, CCS, CCU, di hydrogen um, based and, and, and electrolyzers um, and you know, who knows. But it's very important that we continue to push various technologies and look at every single, single situation. For example, also in India, huh? I mean, India is a very specific case where they, they don't have hydrogen available for the moment. They have a lot of cheap coal. So you need to find a solution, and they need steel. They need. Steel. They cannot wait the next two, 20 years to have enough availability. So they need to get. We need to go ahead. So there will always be a combination of technologies. It's a very important. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask a broad question now, and so any panelists feel free to jump in. So, um, and you spoke a bit about the commoditized and globally traded nature of some industrial products. So, just reflecting on that and thinking about how the, the geopolitics of energy and industry is, is rapidly evolving in response to things like the Russia-Ukraine uh, war and deepening geopolitical division. Um, do, the, do you expect that some of these big picture geopolitical events and trends are going to result in greater or, or more um, protectionist economic policy by different nations, and what do we think this might mean for investment in green industry specifically? Anyone want it? I'll pass down the line. Pick it up if you want it. That is a very good question because, I mean, of course, I, I would say that, yes, we are seeing for the moment rather protectionist reactions. Um, I mean, one big example is, of course, the US, uh, where you basically see climate policy combined with industrial policy. I mean, it is, I, I don't want to say, I mean, it's very good that they are moving and they are putting a lot of money into the system. It's very good, of course, but for global trade and for, you know, making sure that all regions can, we need actually a further alignment. Huh? We really need alignment. I was on a number of panels uh, where also the WTO is now wanting to take a lead and trying to align sectors, align regulations, which is very important because trade, you should never forget, trade is very important to get technologies around, to get to roll it out, to implement, to get the costs down. International trade is important, so we should not forget. So the level playing field is, is, is crucial and, and protectionism is not going to help. So, But of course, we cannot wait until this is all done. Huh? In the meantime, we need to go ahead and um, we need to find solutions transitioning um, towards alignment. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, happy to um, reflect on this. And as somebody who spends a lot of time on both sides of the Atlantic, I can see kind of both perspectives. And I will say that, you know, why I think that for these next generation technologies, actually, there's enough global market share to capture on both sides of the Atlantic, particularly industrial decarbonization. And when I traveled to Euro to Brussels, European Commission said, well, yeah, we have to be, you know, this is going to put a lot of pressure on competitiveness. And of course, the energy crisis, high prices, deindustrialization is already happening in Europe. So I think what's really needed is a new narrative. We heard it earlier on a panel from the Germans. We need to invest faster. We need new options for affordable 24-7 clean electricity. And um, I think one other piece that I want to reflect on is this standard situation. There's a lot of talks in the global north about standards, but often they're created without any agency from developing countries. So again, we talk a lot about regional differentiation of um, the energy transition, different spe speeds, different availability of funds. So we really need to take into account that there might that there has to be global agency and we need to bring along everyone. So I think this is a hugely um, important topic that's going to be evolving more. But I mean, industrial policy, it's not just in the, when we're looking at from the spillover effects from the US, for example, Canada has also reacted with more incentives for green technologies. We've seen a $100 billion partnership between the UAE and um, the US 
investing in carbon capture and storage, next generation, electricity generation. So these are some of the more positive examples of global industrial policy. India is also working really on full value chain renewable energy um, policies. So I think there is just a new wave of industrial policy in a new geoeconomic and geopolitical global setting. Yeah, so it, cement is less affected by this because it's a much more local material. Um, and what is traded is very much clinker because this is a, a, a commodity, but we actually have an oversupply of clinker at the minute, so there's not really much protectionism. I think what's the, 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 pr the, 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 the real challenge, particularly in Africa, is we need to develop local resources because we have a very difficult situation of lack of limestone in Africa. Limestone is 80% of the raw material for making clinker. And this means in countries like Burkina Faso, the clinker is shipped from um, wherever and then has to be trucked right across Ghana. And the consequence of this means that the absolute price of cement in landlocked countries like this can be three times what it is in Europe. And when you think about that in terms of purchasing power, it's, it's crazy. You know, people can't afford cement to build their homes. So this is also where, you know, we've been working to really develop clays because you tend to have a, um, a complementarity between limestone and clay where you have one, you don't have the other. And um, they have very good clays uh, in countries like Burkina Faso and Ghana, which can potentially reduce dramatically their dependence on, on, on imports. So I think this is the kind of um, thing we have to do to develop locally. The good news in, in, in terms of finance, which we keep coming back to, is these products can actually be a lot cheaper, and that drives you know, companies to take them up. But of course, we're still seeing the problem of inequity and in interest rates. Um, you know, the, 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 the projects in Ghana have to pay twice the interest for the projects in Europe, which is you know, completely unfair in my view. Can, yeah, I can just put, uh, say a few words. I think it really depends on what type of protectionist policies come into place. So if they're climate-minded uh, protectionism, obviously it's not the ideal um, solution. But uh, I'd, I'd probably echo uh, your points, Lee, that, that it does create a sort of new industrial policy landscape. And uh, coming back to this international finance institution's point, I think there would still be a role there for these institutions that have an overview of different countries and projects across these countries to bring together sort of best practice from each of those areas in this new landscape. Brilliant, thanks. Um, I'm going to just look around the room for any more hands. If not, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll hand back to Jonas to wrap up, if that's all right. That, is that right? Yeah? Yeah. OK, so um, yeah, Philippe, I'll put, I'll put you on the spot initially, but others feel free to come in. So we talked a bit about policy incentives and finance. Um, just want to think about the role of regulation in this space as well. So this time last year at COP26, the UN Secretary General launched his uh, high-level expert group on, the, on greenwashing effectively and the credibility of corporate net zero commitments and tasked um, former Canadian President Catherine McKenna to go away and come up with some recommendations. Now, the, the, the high-level expert group reported back this week and one of their recommendations was that there was a need for a G20 regulatory task force to uh, align corporate regulation and, and to um, uh, really as a way of fighting greenwashing and driving investment. Do, do we think that regulatory alignment for industrial sectors is A, feasible, and B, desirable in terms of uh, accelerating the and transition? Oh, do you want to? Okay, uh, yes, I think that's, this is a very good question. I think I'd I would uh, hazard a come, come up with the answer that uh, regulatory alignment would uh, be beneficial, but I think um, there's different paces, there's different regions of the, wo of the world that are developing at different paces uh, when it comes to decarbonization um, policies. And I think one of the things we've been looking at uh, within LEADED actually is how um, climate commitments are being met by companies in different jurisdictions and how, how the, the challenges they face on that. And this, uh, this issue of regulatory alignment does come up, but all, they also are uh, reticent of the fact that it's, it, you can't have a sort of one-size-fits-all alignment. 
and that they ha have to work around these differences anyway. Yeah, so kind of a comment on this, this greenwashing, because unfortunately in the cement sector, because it's not well understood, um, there are, you know, almost every week it seems, some startup claiming to have some miracle solution for carbon negative cement. And even more unfortunately, a lot of these startups, which amount to greenwashing at best and other things I could say at worst, are backed by venture capitalists who are, you know, just crazy to try and find some investment opportunity. And I mean, honestly, in the cement sector, it doesn't work like that because if you're going to succeed anything, it's not just being able to produce it, it's having the distribution network and the way to deliver it to customers. And, you know, you can't just suddenly come, you know, there's 3,000 cement plants around the world. You can't just suddenly come in, imagine to build a new cement plant and have any impact whatsoever in the field. So I very much agree that we need to have some kind of way of exposing these greenwashing solutions, but I really don't think it can be done very easily at a government level. Um, you know, there's too many vested interests in, in, in this and the sort of people who think, yeah, yeah we're going to come up with the next uh, iPhone or whatever, you know, it doesn't work like that in heavy industry. Um, I, I will, on behalf of the steel sector, I have to say, I mean, we, we see almost every week a new standard coming up. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, I think it is extremely important that there is alignment, um, but I think we also need them very, very quickly. We need a standard very quickly because it's extremely important that people understand what they are buying, what is, what is actually basically low carbon. I mean, a lot of people talk about green steel, for example, which is not what we want to talk about because we are talking about low carbon steel, generally speaking. So, and uh, it's extremely important that it's whatever will come out. I mean, so I think desirable would be one international standard, but I said already before, we need it as quickly as possible, so we cannot wait. Um, so I would say, and, and there are, we have spent some time thinking about it, we have published what we think is important, for example. It's very important that there is transparency, that people understand what it is, that standards can talk to each other, there's interoperability, basically, so that there is trade. And I think very important is that we continue to push, for example, in steel, that for the deep Decar decarbonization and technology agnostics, that all technologies can coexist and continue decarbonization. Thank you. And I will echo technology um, openness, but I do want to say one thing from our perspective on the private sector and governments, what we're seeing is kind of a game of chicken, right? And so what we're hoping to see, and we actually this played out on a panel here earlier where private sector said we need the free allocations because we can't transform the, the assets. But what I think is really important is now where there's policy instruments available, particularly in the EU, but also in the US to transform assets, the private sector has a responsibility to show up and to show that they can take the incentives, the funding that is available and be first movers and responsibly implement some of these next generation technologies as well as um, infrastructure. This goes for hydrogen where we also need to overcome regulatory barriers such as hydrogen certification based on LCA analysis. But then I think there's an accountability. And again, where we are, we're at the implementation COP, right? So anything you're pledging, you need to be able to be accountable for over the next decade. And I think we as civil society need to pay much more attention to what is being pledged and be much more forthright, okay, is this, is this project going to happen? Is this infrastructure going to happen? And um, I hope that at the next implementation COP, at COP28, we're going to come together and we're going to check, okay, which of these projects that were announced um, actually happened, actually went maybe from fee to investment to FID. So, um, yeah, that's, I think, how we would approach this topic. Thank you. I mean, that's a, a, that's a great note to end on. So um, I'll hand back to Jonas in a minute. But, um, you know, on behalf of everyone, in, including the people online, thank you to our panelists for uh, their excellent contributions. And thanks to Bologna for giving me the easy job of asking the tough questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Theo, and thanks a lot to the excellent uh, panel here. Um, so I got the privilege to, to wrap up with a few words. Um, I'm going to actually, maybe this is perception bias, but I'm going to try to wrap this up in two words, which is system thinking. Maybe I'm banging a bit our own drum here because this is something we are trying to push a lot in the policy conversations. But I think system thinking uh, in the context of industry is extremely important. I think, Karen, you put it very well here. When we talk about greenwashing, sometimes that is greenwashing, intentional greenwashing, quite often, but sometimes it's also real confusion. And the confusion often derives from a lack of system understanding and system thinking. So, you know, the understanding of, if you, if you have a solution that we're discussing, and we talk about silver bullets, what, you know, what, if you do something in one part of the forest, you need to also understand what impact that has in a different part of the forest. Uh, and that is very often not the case for government policies. Governments tend to work in silos. You have a you know, Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Climate, not often working that well together. I think we see that on a lot of different levels. So that system thinking, um, I would say, is also really important when it comes to the jobs. And what we heard from Montserrat here earlier, and that's part of the conversation about just transition. If we do something about industry, we also need to think about the social aspect of that. That's also part of the system thinking we need to insist on. So with that, thanks a lot to everyone who's been here today, and the, not least, of course, to the speakers and panelists. Thank you so much.